Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Your Excellency, welcome to the Centre for European Studies at the ANU. Uh, my name is Pierre van der Eng, I'm the Deputy Director of the Centre. Uh, the Director of the Centre, Jack, Professor Jacqueline Law, uh, could not be with us uh, today. She, she sends her apologies and uh, she's sorely missed. Um, this uh, Centre of European Studies is supported by four uh, different colleges at the ANU, uh, the College of Business and Economics, and I am from the College of Business and Economics. I'm uh, stationed here for one year uh, to assist the director in organizing all kinds of events. And of course, uh, replacing her if she's not available. Um, the College of Law, which uh, delivered a deputy director last year. So last year's uh, theme was uh, uh, related to the field of law and last year we had various uh, events in relation to uh, the, the, the field of law. We have two, of, two other colleges who will deliver a deputy director next year, uh, the College of Arts and Social Sciences and in the last year uh, of the funding cycle, the current funding cycle of the centre, uh, the College of Arts, uh, sorry, the College of Asia and the Pacific will deliver an, uh, a deputy director and the theme then will be Asia and the Pacific. Um, you can guess from that that uh, the activities of the center are very much um, multidisciplinary. Uh, we, we engage uh, scholars uh, and we engage the community uh, in a range of different uh, areas, uh, a range of different academic areas as well. Multidisciplinary but also interdisciplinary. For example, my interest is in uh, business studies uh, but I also take an interest in uh, what we are going to learn about uh, today, the poetry of Yeats. Um, uh, a range of activities that we organize, for example, uh, our next activity uh, following uh, uh, this uh, public lecture will be uh, next Tuesday, a public lecture on uh, the European Union's policy to combat uh, uh, child labor in the world. During the last two weeks, the center hosted uh, a very successful exhibition, uh, which you see around you here, uh, to honor the Irish poet William Butler Yeats. It was organized uh, together with the uh, Embassy of the Republic of Ireland and we're very fortunate to have the support of, uh, of the Embassy for this uh, exhibition and also for today's event. The exhibition coincides with, uh, as you may know, the exhibition uh, that uh, is currently ongoing on the Irish in uh, Australia, located at the National Museum and uh, people uh, attending that uh, exhibition at the uh, National Museum have been wandering in to see the exhibition here on Yates uh, uh, over the last uh, two weeks. Um, so from our perspective it has been quite successful. Uh, unfortunately the Yates exhibition will conclude this year, uh, sorry, will definitely this year, but uh, this week. Um, um, because we need to, to free up the space to uh, accommodate other events. As I mentioned, next week, Tuesday, we have a further event. Um, today, uh, we will have a lecture uh, by Ronna MacDonald, who is standing here to my right, uh, one of our well-known colleagues in the fields of uh, Irish studies um, from the University of New South Wales. Um, this event is also organized together with the em Embassy of the Republic of Ireland, so we're very grateful for the em to the Embassy for uh, its support. Um, Ronald McDonnell, um, like I said, is from the uh, University of New South Wales, where he's a professor in the School of English, Media and the Performing <coughs> Arts. He has a wide range of research interests, including, of course, uh, uh, various aspects of Irish studies, Irish literature, Irish society, uh, Irish culture and politics, and most likely uh, a few more than that. Um, Professor MacDonald will speak to us for about 45 minutes, and uh, we're really keen uh, to see whether after that 45 minutes uh, you, you, you will have further questions about Yeats or things Irish that uh, Professor MacDonald will be able to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, and thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, you're about to see the most uh, boring PowerPoint display ever put on. You can either make a choice between you know, giving a handout, which is black and white, or you can have a multimedia PowerPoint. I've kind of combined the two and had a PowerPoint which is just text. 
<laughs> possibly to avoid upstaging the, um, the wonderful exhibition as if that were possible. But th thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the Irish Embassy and the ANU, and I particularly uh, uh, want to thank um, His Excellency Martino Fanin for coming today. And actually, we have two ambassadors here. We also have ex Ambassador Richard O'Brien, uh, ex Irish Ambassador Richard O'Brien here, and Orla Tunney for the Consul. So thanks to all of them, to them for inviting me and, and for taking time to come to uh, uh, today's lecture. Um, as Pierre said, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in broad terms about Yeats and some of the major themes of his work and his uh, intellectual development. Uh, in particular, how we constructed ideas of Ireland and how we often pitted ideas of Ireland, not necessarily the real Ireland, but ideas of Ireland against certain aspects of the modern world. Like many, like many modernists, uh, Yeats often disdained modernity or, or aspects of modernity. Certain currents he saw developing uh, in the modern world, which he rebuked and reviled. Uh, many of his positions in, in, in disdaining the modern world we would find quite conservative today, even politically repugnant. Certainly the, Yeater, the later Yeats in his flirtation uh, with fascism, that would be the case. But Yeats was an oligarch uh, and, and I believed in aristocrats, and he had many political views which would, for we, many, which, which we might you know, dispute or, or, or find problematic uh, these days. And one of the interesting questions about Yeats, as so many of the great modernists who, who also had such views, is the relationship between that politics and this extraordinary poetry. Uh, I also want to, in looking at some of this intellectual background to Yeats, I also want to do something which, which um, maybe will complement the contextual survey that you have, this wonderful, these wonderful banners, by looking at some of the individual poems. Uh, so I'm going to start maybe by ma talking quite broadly about Yeats and his, his uh, intellectual formation, putting him in the context, as I say, of certain divisions of, in, in, uh, in, um, in modernity, and then I look at some of the, the, the a, few, a few of the quite well-known poems and try to finish so we can have some questions if there if there are any. Um, I'm just going to start by looking at the, the abstract I gave for this lecture. Uh, I quoted from this poem. It's a late poem. I'm not going to spend too too, too too much time on it, but it's it's one of the, I mean, Yeats died in 1939, so this is one of his last poems, uh, marked by the hauteur, uh, this kind of quite exhilarating hauteur I find it haughtiness. Of, of the later Yeats. Um, but I, I wanted to quote it because it puts in opposition what is, in explicit opposition, what's implicit in my title, namely Yeats, Ireland and the Modern World, where he says, um, I mean, it's a complicated poem about statues and about how humans create God, but this is the final stanza which I've quoted here. When Pierce summoned Cú Cullen to his side, what stalked through the post office? What intellect, what calculation, number, measurement replied? We Irish, born into that ancient sect, but thrown upon this filthy modern tide, and by its formless spawning fury wrecked, climb to our proper dark, that we may trace the lineaments of a plummet measured face. The line I quoted in the abstract, which I want to focus on here, is we Irish, born, born into that ancient sect, but thrown upon this filthy modern tide. This is Yeats at the end of his career, but that opposition, that idea of Ireland, as to some, st some, state, to some extent a salve to some of the depredations and debasements of the modern world is something that Yeats imbibed quite early. Now, that might seem, from one point of view, as if he sees I Ireland as always pre-modern, or as in some way uh, an exception to what's happening in the modern world. But it's more complicated than that, because finding alternatives to uh, modernity to the mob, to certain uh, habits of mind which he see, saw as underrating the imagination and poetry and idealism and religion and those things he liked, is itself part of modernity. It, it, it is extremely modern to be anti-modern. Uh, and many of, the, many of the major writers of the early 20th, 20th century were. Eliot, T.S. Eliot looked back to 17th century France. Yeats at various times looked back to ancient Ireland, uh, in, his, in his younger days and as he got older to 18th century Protestant Anglo-Ireland as kind of an alternative to what he saw as, what he describes here as the formless spawning fury.
But the formula spawning fury is, I mean, this, this is written in 39, obviously. It's a, it's a year when the Second World War is going to start. Yeats himself has lived through uh, uh, the early decades of the 20th century marked by war, revolution, and violence, um, uh, and experienced some of it at quite close quarters in Ireland. So he has that reaction. But nonetheless, the spawning fury of the modern world isn't simply uh, political, uh, um, political movements uh, and mob rule and democracy, which he wasn't very fond of. It also, uh, and this goes back to very, very early, and this is where I think his Irishness comes in, characterizes what, what we might call a, a materialist frame of mind. And by materialist, I don't just mean you know, an interest in objects and nice cars and Manoli Blanock shoes, okay? I mean, a, a not just acquisitiveness, I mean a scientific way of looking at the world, an empirical way of looking at the world, um, which he associated in his own mind with England and at other stages with the Irish middle classes. So against a pragmatic, scientific way of looking at the world, he sought to oppose a... Uh, a uh, non-empirical, imaginative, idealist, religious in the widest sense of that term, not belonging to any conventional religion, uh, occult quite often. We must remember Yeats's huge interest from a very early age and enduring interest in various occult systems, all of which fed into his poetry. But it was, if you like, an anti-enlightenment idea of the world. If we think of the English Enlightenment philosophically as Locke, John Locke, David Hume, that sort of idea which led to the, the surge and the dominance of science, which he saw as completely overwhelming the modern world with its arid, realist aesthetic, very realist in terms of the sort of aesthetic, the sort of art it tended to prize, but surface orientated and dislocating people from the great reservoirs of idealism and value, which he saw as still within Ireland. So his nationalism, if you like, was part of a re complicated reaction to an internationalism and to currents that he saw as all around Europe, as happening all around Europe. We Irish, by the way, is a phrase he gets from Bishop Berkeley, the Irish philosophy, philosopher, who countered Locke's empiricism with a mode of idealism and is said to have used the phrase, we Irish do not hold with that against, against uh, uh, Locke's empiricism. It's a phrase that Yeats in complicated ways often wanted to push. There is, though, that, that seeing the Irish as to some extent non-English or the opposite to England, as having, having embodying a certain national character, which was the opposite to England, does itself have a long pedigree. Uh, Yeats was very influenced by Matthew Arnold, the great 19th century intellectual and uh, thinker poet, who wrote to categorize the Irish um, uh, in, in a positive sense, but in his, in, his, in his essay on the study of Celtic literature, saw the Celt as being a salve to the Saxon, being, an, being, being the opposite to the Saxon, by bringing the softer virtues, the feminine virtues, as he saw it. So while the Saxon was pragmatic, rational, hard-headed, scientific, the Celt was emotional, spiritual, poetic, and he had a whole list of characteristics he, he, he said, Arnold famously said, that um, the Celt revolts against the despotism of fact. Okay, and he meant that as a compliment. Right. Despotism of fact. So there is a sort of a sense in which the 19th century saw, and, and before if you want to go back, saw a certain movement which, which is sometimes called as Celticism, which saw the Irish and the English in kind of a, a, operating in complicated a, oppositional way. So when, when Samuel Beckett, uh, much later, was asked by a journalist if he was English, and he responded, au contraire. He was, in some, to some sense, picking up on that sort of tendency, that sort of construction of Ireland and England in opposition. What Yeats did with it was, he took, it, took Arnold's idea. For Arnold, the Saxon and the Celt were like the ideal Victorian marriage. But there was no question who was dominant. It was the male figure who was dominant, and the female brought sweetness and light into the imperial home, which is why Arnold opposed home rule. For Yeats took that and used it as a reason to, to, to vouchsafe Irish independence and Irish nationalism, that exceptionalism. 
So I think when we're looking at, at, at Yeats's nationalism and his interest in Ireland and his We Irish, we need to kind of factor in some of those, some of that history. Yet, 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 as always, there is much more. Because um, when we scratch beneath the surface, we find fascinating and revealing complexity and ambivalence in Yeats's own intellectual disposition. It would be severely misleading to think that Yeats's um, uh, opposition to scientism, to empiricism, to materialism of England is uh, the whole story. Because there's a huge strain of, of interest in science and observation and proof. Yeats is always looking after proof. He never believes what he, he believes everything, you know, apart from what's in front of him, what he can see. He's very, very credulous, but he's always looking for proof. Even when he joins in the 1890s, all these spiritualist societies like the Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, he, he's seeking for evidence, obsessed with evidence. Uh, he, in fact, he gets uh, um, expelled in the 1890s from uh, the esoteric section of the Order of the Golden Dawn, which is an occult society, for trying to come up with an experiment to revive the um, spirits of dead flowers. Okay? So we get this kind of, rather what we would regard maybe now as a bit Southern Californian interest in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the occult, in, in horoscopes, in seances. Um, what, what George Steiner described, the, the, the critic George Steiner described some years ago as hairdresser stuff. Uh, uh, all this kind of belief, but yet at the same time he kind of wants to bring it back to a scientific aspect. And this creates fascinating tensions in his work. And there's one word I think which embodies Yeats's work, Yeats's poetry and his, his philosophy, it's conflict. It's always oppositional, there's always conflict, there are always poles in his, in his positions. But I want to just have a look, very, very brief look at his own description, because we find in Yeats and in a number of other writers, like John Millington Singh, was an early uh, infatuation with science. A lot of the, the Yeats used to wander around uh, collecting specimens, as many people of this class <laughs> and background would, collecting specimens, butterflies, I think he was particularly interested in, and rocks. And, quite, quite um, uh, interested in naturalism and natural science. Uh, and he records in his autobiographies a kind of a, a deconversion experience, how he moves from this fascination with science away towards folklore um, uh, and eventually into mythology and eventually into all types of aspects of, um, of uh, uh, spiritualism and the occult. Um, part of Yeats's, this journey for Yeats is his relationship with his father which is hugely important. His father was an artist, as, as, we, as we can, if you've read that, it describes this, his father's art. But he was also very taken with Mill and Darwin, and 19th century um, scientific thinkers and progressive thinkers. And Yeats initially was very bound to these people, but later kind of went through this, and he describes it as kind of an Oedipal conflict away from his father, who was scientific, not, not, not the way a number of other Victorian you know, young you, you, you autobiographies describe the kind of the, 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 the story is usually a conflict with a religious father towards materialism or atheism or agnosticism. Yeats had a, had a conflict with his atheist father towards various, various modes of invented religion. Uh, Yeats invented this con tremendous concoction of religion and spirituality um, with a bit of Christianity, a bit of Eastern religion, a lot of occult, a lot of the Kabbalah thrown in, and used this as a source to write this extraordinary poetry. So I just want to have a quick look, quick look at this quotation. It's from the autobiographies. Um, Huxley and Tyndall, T.H. Huxley, Huxley and John Tyndall, scientists, Huxley was a popularizer known as Darwin's bulldog. Tyndall was an Irish scientist, uh, um, uh, who, both of them Darwinists. So he writes this, I, I, was, I was unlike others of my generation and one thing only, I am very religious, he says. Not quite true given his father. His mother was a little bit, but not quite mm -hmm. true. Uh, and deprived by Huxley and Tyndall, whom I detested, of the simple-minded religion of my childhood, I had made a new religion, almost an infallible church of poetic tradition, of a fardel of stories and of personages and of emotions, inseparable from their first exp expression, passed on from generation to generation by poets and painters with some help from philosophers and theologians. I wished for a world where I could discover this tradition perpetually, and not in pictures and in poems only, but in tiles around the chimney piece and in the hangings that kept out the draft. 
I mean, what's interesting, he wrote this in, 19, in 1921, uh, published in 1921, in the second volume of his memoir. But it's interesting the way he constructs his, his instinct to make um, a new religion. And that's really what he does all the way through his life. He invents uh, extraordinary amalgamations of, 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 of different religions, culminating in his uh, very difficult book, A Vision, which he first published in 25, re revisited and reworked in, in 37. Um, but it's funny that he, that, 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 that he ascribes this to what is, in effect, a, a, a European crisis of faith. What he constructs was a crisis of faith, a, a world one. Darwin and the, 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 the uh, challenge that uh, the ideas of natural selection, ideas of, of science, posed to conventional religion. I mean, it's extraordinary paradox that he talks about deprived of this religion, but yet he detests it. So it has power, but it's also detested. Uh, and I think it complicates that opposition to science uh, that we see in Yeats all the way through. Elsewhere in his, in his, uh, in his memoir, he describes himself going around with his, with his net and his chisel, picking up samples. Uh, and he's a bit of an evangelist for, for, for non-religion. So, um, I've just, just want to quote here. He sounds a little bit like, I mean, hot for argument in refutation of Adam and Noah and seven days. I had read Darwin and Wallace, Huxley and Haeckel, all uh, evolutionists of various sort, and would spend hours on a holiday plaguing a pious geologist who, when not at some da job in Guinness's brewery, came with a hammer to look for fossils uh, uh, in the Hoth Cliffs. Uh, this is um, this is an uh, interesting contrast to the Yeats we, we know now. Here he sounds, who's very anti-scientific and very anti-materialist. He sounds here like a sort of Richard Dawkins character who goes around you know, trying to uh, upset the faithful and the pious by, by um, uh, showing the evidence of, from the fossil record and so, and so on. And I think that in assessing the later Yeats, we need to kind of bear in mind that this is where he, he came from. Um, and it makes him a more modernist figure in assessing the sort of poetry he writes, rather than simply a reactive one. Later, in the 1890s, he moves into, uh, as I said, folklore, Irish mythology, uh, and the occult of various forms. That move is itself uh, a cosmopolitan move. Cos by cosmopolitan, I mean it's international. Yeats's, and the embra Yeats's embrace of uh, traditional Irish culture and folklore is part of a European movement sometimes called primitivism, which happens all around Europe. So I think we need to understand Yeats, yes, as an Irish poet, but also as one responding to the crises and developments of the modern world. He's also very, influ he's very influenced by intellectual currents from Europe. He's also very influenced by aesthetic, cultural, poetic ones. Yeats is very, uh, uh, the, the, and the earliest one, which endures, is French symbolism. Um, the poets of France, from which that movement towards the concretion of the symbol in poets like Verlaine and Baudelaire, which, from which modernist poetic experiment sprang uh, a generation later. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Yeats, and one of the really significant things about him, um, and one of the reasons why trying to write, talk, talk about him is, 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 is a challenge, is because, not just because he, he lived quite a long life, but because he did so much in it, and he was at the forefront of so many movements. The forefront of the 1890s, Friends with Oscar Wilde, a part of the Rhymers Club. Moving on, of the, the Symbolist Movement, Friends of Arthur Simmons, who brought the Symbolist Movement into England, in, in, into English language. Um, part of the Modernist Movement, and then, I mean, most people, most great writers, even very, very substantial writers, like William Wordsworth, write great work when they're young, or maybe when they're a little bit older, and then uh, fade off. The extraordinary thing about Yeats is he's one of those writers a little bit like Goethe, who had many peaks, an extraordinary peak in, 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 his, in, in the um, 1920s uh, with, with the publication of The Tower and, 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 and The Winding Stair, with his tremendous modernist volume. So he's part of all these different movements, as well as being a theatre impresario, a senator, a lecturer, um, an essayist, uh, uh, and a various, a public man, as he calls himself. Uh, so there's, there's so many strands to Yeats, um, but nonetheless, we must recognize a, a, a long career with various different um, peaks, as it were, 
but also a figure whose nationalism was never less than internationalism, never international. Uh, here's an example, another quote uh, from an essay, which indicates two things. The influence of a certain 1890s language, um, which is wavering and dreamlike, very much very Walter Pater, very much part of the decadence, very much of its era, uh, an influence of symbolism, but also the beginnings of this reaction against surfaces, against materialism and realism and naturalism that would uh, uh, embody many of his, much of his career. So he says, man has wooed and won the world and has fallen weary in the 1890s, full of that weariness, uh, um, that sort of sense of a culture gone overripe. Uh, that will not, will, end, will not end until the last autumn, when the stars shall be blown away like withered leaves. He grew weary when he said, these things that I touch and see are alone real, for he saw them without illusion at last, and found them but air and dust and moisture. So what he's really saying is, uh, here, he's talking about how investing reality in the evidence of the senses, the way the empiricists do, the way a certain scientific mode, the way, the way a materialist does in England, is to disenchant them, to desacralize them, to turn them into air and dust and moisture. He's trying to get away from that sort of uh, mentalité to celebrate a deeper, more spiritual, more imaginative life. And I mentioned Matthew Arnold before. Matthew Arnold taught that into the breach left by religion, culture would enter. And Yeats is Arnoldian enough here to agree. He says, the arts are, I believe, about to take upon their shoulders the burdens that have fallen from the shoulders of priests and to lead us back upon our journey by filling our thoughts with the essences of things and not with things. So the essences of things are not to be revealed on surfaces appearances, which is why it's so necessary to renovate literature, to throw away the realist forms in fiction and indeed in poetry uh, of the 19th century and find new modes, to find, uh, uh, to find emblems adequate to our predicament, as Heaney would, call, would call it. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at uh, one of an early poem before moving into looking at some of uh, the later Yeats's poems, and in particular his response to political crisis uh, and changes in Irish society and indeed European society. The poem I want to uh, look at will be very well known. It's, it's from The Winds Among, Among the Reed, his 1899 volume, which uh, published and written, I suppose, around this time, is still very marked with that dreamy seductive, sensuous, descriptive language of the 1890s, and also with very, very intense symbols. And this poem is a, uh, one of the many poems at this stage, and later in his career, that he writes to his muse, Maud Gaughan, the woman who he met, his unrequited love, um, and his uh, a sort of basement in front of, of, uh, in front of her, but yet, a, and it is a poem about, about a sort of a basement or, a, or an abjection, um, but it also, I think, indicates many of the aesthetic and intellectual preoccupations we've just been talking about. It's it'll probably been known to many of you. He wishes for the cloths of heaven, a poem which is itself a sort of a cloth, insofar as it's written in one sentence and it kind of unfurls like a cloth, like a large cloth. He says. Uh, had I the heavens embroidered cloths, in wrath with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread in my dreams. As I say, we have that opulence of the 1890s, an intense sense of rich language with a very, very rich metaphor and a very unlikely metaphor, such as uh, a symbol, effectively, where the sky, through a conceit, through a conceit of the poetic mind, becomes figured as a rich cloth. And we have opposition between, therefore, opulence of language and a, a certain paucity of language, which becomes very explicit in the final two lines and the final line, where there's a kind of an arrest, where the rich descriptive language 
becomes kind of arrested or pulled back, where he says, but I've been poor of only my dreams, and it's just one line. We even, I think it's also significant, the repetition of the word dreams at the end, as if he's making that word do more work, or pulling back. So it's kind of, it's a poem which, and I think it's proleptically modernist in this way, anticipates a lot of the modernist, modernist movement, even though it's in its date it's a little bit before what we'd call high modernism, enacts what it is expressing. In other words, its form re reproduces what it's being said. It's for, insofar as the, form, the poem is like a big cloth, it unravels like a big cloth, but it also pulls back at the end. It is um, an eight-lined poem, doesn't quite, pulls back from being a sonnet, pulls back, I mean, if, if, if he did have more words, he might have written the full 14 of a sonnet, of a love sonnet. But here he pulls back, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, therefore the poem is sort of indicating what it, what it, uh, what it is expressing in its own form. So that's, that's Yeats of the 1890s. When he moves on, as I mentioned, the multifaceted Yeats, the Yeats of the, of the Abbey Theatre, his collaboration with Lady Gregory, um, and his involvement, I suppose, maybe beginning, uh, 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 or most famously, in his um, uh, collection responsibilities with modern Irish life. Now, I said at the time that Yeats had reacted against England, but also the Irish middle classes, um, who, which he who associated with a mercantile, and pinched, impoverished uh, values that he saw as antithetical to those reservoirs of, of, of idealism and uh, um, uh, community, an organic connection with the wellsprings of truth, which he saw as accessible still in West Ireland and rural Ireland, and also through the remnants of aristocracy. So very anti-middle class. Uh, I know there are a few people in Ireland here, so you'll all know, I'm going to give you a little brief quote from a very well-known and accessible poem, which indicates that opposition to the middle class, and it also indicates uh, um, Yeats's frustration with the, uh, a certain um, torpor in Ireland. It's a poem which reads very ironically, given what was about to happen. Uh, this is September 1913. I'm just quoting two stanzas from it, where he indicates this. Yeats, some of Yeats's uh, 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 poems of the middle period are very angry, very angry. Um, and I think that's significant because one of the one of the tones that you find in Yeats, which which when it works, is tremendously exhilarating, is a a first person, an I, but also a sense of oratorical power, such as we saw in the statue statues, and such as we get in the great poems of the Tower. But here he's being scornful, and he says, "What need you being come to sense?" but fumble in a greasy till and add the halfpence to the pence and prayer to shivering prayer until you have dried the marrow from the bone. For men were born to pray and save. Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. Yet they were of a different kind, the names that stilled your childish play. They have gone about the world like wind, but little time had they to pray for whom the hangman's rope was spun. And what... God help us, could they save? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. O'Leary, by the way, is John O'Leary, an old Fenian who Yeats, who Yeats knew uh, uh, um, in the 90s, uh, lived in France. Uh, and we find here, I think, you know, I, I just wanted to um, indicate it because of Yeats's the sense of disdain for a mercantile middle class who didn't have any, what Yeats saw as worthwhile values. Uh, here, there are also uh, uh, nationalist values, poetic values, but nationalist ones, which he would have aligned, in which he calls Romantic Ireland. Romantic is a very interesting word in Yeats. He describes in, 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 in Cool Park, he describes himself in the Irish Revivalists as, we, are, we were the last romantics. And he himself, huge part of his Europeanism uh, is, is, is his influence from, by European romantics and English romantics particularly Blake and, and uh, Shelley. Uh, I want to, another one of his, I mean, Yeats, as I said, puts what he calls elsewhere, the dream of the noble and the beggarman. And he finds an alignment between aristocratic values and 
folklore peasant values. So we find, he finds a connection between the two. It's what jo John Millington Singh, who shared some of his, uh, well, a very different figure, but nonetheless in this respect uh, 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 could be compared, talked about how the wild stallion and the thoroughbred are uh, quite alike. Will wildness and that which is bred to great achievement quite alike. So Yeats loved Anglo-Ireland, the Irish ascendancy, the big house, uh, which he associated with high culture, with a community which, which guaranteed cultural value, these wonderful these old houses with, with, with great paintings, uh, and not least because of his friendship with Lady Gregory, where he went and spent summers for many years and, and, and wrote his collaborator, Lady Gregory, who spoken about um, uh, uh, in, in the exhibition here. Um, and he valorized aristocratic values and aristocratic beliefs. Uh, and he does this, and the politics of that are quite troubling for us sometimes. The, uh, and I'm going to look, I mean, there, there, are, there are many poems I could look at, but I'm going to look at another one of Yeats's very famous poems, which is an elegy for Lady Gregory's son, Robert Gregory, of whom Yeats wrote a number of poems, uh, who died in the First World War. He was an airman, and he died in the First World War. And Yeats imagines him as a kind of a, a kind of a Nietzschean ubermensch, someone, someone who was above the normal run-of-the-mill things. He embodies a certain noble aristocratic uh, 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 um, value system, which Yeats is clearly very sympathetic towards. Um, and he writes this poem, which is, effectively, which is a poem which is an extraordinarily beautiful and accessible poem, um, full of motifs of balance, as he imagines this airman uh, uh, imagining his, uh, his, his mm -hmm. death. It's called An Irish Airman Foresees His Death, and that's going to show it. Maybe, I'm sure many of you know it very well. Um, I'll just read it and maybe say a few words about it before moving on to another couple of poems. Um, I know that I shall meet my fate. Okay, so if it, if the pagination is gone, or the lines have gone a bit haywire here, I'm afraid, but nonetheless, if you can imagine uh, paragraph breaks where the, f the big letters are, or line breaks where the, where the capitals are. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight I do not hate. Those that I guard I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. Nor law nor duty bade me fight, nor public men nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. A poem tremendously shot through with poise and balance, uh, in which Lines for, for we have effectively quatrains, 16 line poem based upon quatrains uh, of rhymes between love and, 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 and above and love, cross and loss, poor before, alternating rhymes. We've loss and gain. Um, uh, we have the years behind and the years to come. And it culminates in that, that last quatrain. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath a waste of breath, the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. It's tremendously poetic effect, poetically affecting, but comes, I think, from a difficult politics. It's difficult for us reading it, because it comes from a politics based upon indiv an individual, an aristocratic individual in this sense, um, excelling, transcending. Um, the sort of ethic, or the aesthetic of, as I say, uh, a Nietzschean value system. Uh, of someone who pulls themselves above. There is this line, my country is Kiltartan's cross, my countrymen Kiltartan's poor. Kiltartan, by the way, is the area around Cool Park where Lady, Gregory, uh, Lady Gregory's house was. Um, and he's identifying with them, sure enough, but nonetheless, he says, no law nor duty bade me fight, nor public men nor cheering cries. The impulse was, if you like, a self-destructive impulse, a lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in, 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 the crowd, uh, in, in the clouds. So it is, if you like, it's actually, a, I mean, you talk about the politics, it's also a sort of a poem celebrating suicide, in actual fact. He says the years 
uh, I balanced all, brought all to mind, the years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind. So there's, we have this sort of strange and tremendously affecting combination of someone who is living more intensely than everybody else, and their intense, his intense living uh, is, 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 it becomes um, symbolized by the flight. I know that I shall meet my fate. It starts off when he hasn't yet ascended. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Uh, then he's up there. He's in the cloud. Uh, a lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. But his consideration, what we have here is a combination of someone who's living very, very intensely, and his intense living is leading to a sort of rejection of life. So it's a poem which is very poetically effective, but which is thematically and politically troubling. And I don't think the two are separate, separable. I think this is a really interesting uh, uh, way of thinking about Yeats. I don't think about all the modernist poets. It's easy, it's easy way to solve the problem of Yeats's politics. is simply to say, oh, the poetry is separate. No, I think quite often it's a little bit like cooking blowfish. You know? if, 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 if it's not cooked just the right way, it's poisonous. And some of Yeats's poems are. But out of the quite noxious po politics, you get an extraordinarily effective uh, uh, poems, such as we get in later uh, 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 in the later Yeats. Okay, I think I, I started at about uh, close to ten past. Did you say we have to finish at one, or can I go? Are we going a little bit later? Uh, please take another five minutes. Okay, no, that's fine. I just, I just, because I, I, I started a little bit late, and I'm wondering. I've got two more poems I want to look at. One of them is quite long, um, but it's very well known. Um, but I'll run through it quite quickly. I think I, I wanted to look at it because of the mention of Pierce at the start and because of the mention of September 1913. When Yeats, it's one of Yeats's really well-known poem, poems. And again, it's a, it, it, it is a work which, as with Yeats's tremendously, you know, his really great poems, hinges between a concern with history, politics, a response to politics, and myth. Um, something outside poetry, something outside the everyday. He kind of, he, he doesn't simply retreat into his tower. He wouldn't be a great poet if he did and abstract himself in symbols. He's tremendously open to the forces of history and at the same time seeks a way of uh, mythologizing them and mediating. This poem is a very well-known poem, the Partition 1916 I'm not going to look at, um, but is, um, uh, um, a very ambivalent poem, I think. When I studied it in school, I, 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 I remember like doing it for the intershirt or something, as many of you probably did, the Irish people here, and it was seen as simply a, 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 a tribute to the rebels. It is a tribute to the rebels, but it's an ambivalent response, very ambivalent response. And some of the lines which are taken from it would be familiar to you. We talked about too long a sacrifice. You can make a stone of the heart. Uh, hearts were one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. Those lines often taken out as an indictment of fanaticism, or at the same time the poem is used as a thing. I, I think just two, I think just two strands in it. But it is, a, uh, it is I think, one of, the, um, one of the great poems, one of great, Yeats's great poems, and one of the great poems in which a powerful imagination tries to consider and come to terms with uh, an act which is a political uh, act of, uh, uh, a serious historical act, but also a tragedy. We find that this poem is a recognition of, of, of a growing tragedy. Okay, I'll try and move through it relatively quickly. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tailor a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when, young and beautiful, she rode to harriers? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse, this other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. 
Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Hearts with one purpose alone, through summer and winter seem, enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range, from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim, and a horf plashes within it. The long-legged moorhens dive, and hens to moorcocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part. Our part, to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child, when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. One of, one of the ways this poem gets its shape um, is by moving from the vague to the particular. From uh, the first, you, you know, it says, wherever green is worn at the end there. That starts out as motley. Start at the, uh, uh, um, at the very start, we talked about um, uh, uh, um, being certain, but they and I, the last. Uh, uh, um, Quatrain, be certain that, I, that they and I would live where motley is worn. Motley is mixed color. That at the end becomes green. And it's significant that the way that the poem, that kind of idea of vagueness or mixed move, color moves from them. They're never named until the end. So we get this notion of epitaph or tribute towards the end. Um, so he remembers, I mean, it's quite colloquial, and he remembers meeting them and kind of uh, going to his club many of them known to, many of the insurgents are known to Yeats famously, uh, uh, um, because some of them are poets, as he puts it in the, uh, in, in the next stanza. Um, uh, it's four stanzas, by the way. It's not quite clear from this division, because I had to, I had to uh, break the second and the third stanza into two slides. So he moves in the second stanza into moving a little bit more particular. That woman, which is Constance Markovitz, who he knew as a child, and he elegizes elsewhere. Uh, were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew, sw grew shrill. This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. That's Patrick Pierce, who we mentioned before. Uh, kept a school, famously St. Enda's, rode our winged horse is Pegasus, who indicates poetry. Uh, this other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force, Thomas McDonough. Uh, he might have won fame in the end. So he's, we've moved from, the, I've met them, to more, they haven't been named yet, but more obvious descriptions. <coughs> But notice, notice in the whole, in the whole of the poem, um, the alternating rhyme, which creates a sense of momentum. Okay, and we've short tetrameter lines. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew sure. We've got this sense of momentum, a sense of building up to something, and how the poetic form and the choice of words uh, indicates uh, that sense of, 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 of drive and momentum. Um, this is the second part of that second section. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken and glorious lout, well, that's John McBride, um, uh, uh, Maud Gaughan's husband, who uh, was, a, uh, for Yeats, was, was abusive to Maud Gaughan and, and his old, and uh, Yeats was not a, a, a fan, but he, uh, which is what he's referring to there. Yet I number him in my song. He too, and then he becomes explicit, this move from comedy to tragedy, the motley worn by the, clou by the clown to the single colour. Uh, he too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. I have to say, a terrible beauty is born, you know, a very striking line. It's also, I think we could say, a terrible cliché is born, because it has become <laughs> one of the most clichéd uh, uh, lines uh, about, uh, about Ireland, terrible beauty. But that kind of, I mentioned ambivalence, and I mentioned uh, uh, conflict, and I mentioned contrast, and a terrible beauty is, is, is nonetheless incarnates that. Um, uh, Yeats, certainly, a figure whose work embodies for all the the, 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 the oratorical power of his verse, it is verse, it's poetry. 
Uh, he says, Yeats famously said, it's a very uh, a significant quotation, I think. He said that um, rhetoric, I'm going to get this right, I've written it down somewhere. Yeah, uh, uh, of our conflicts with others, we make rhetoric, rhetoric. Of our conflicts with ourselves, we make poetry. So there is no distilling a single view from this, from, from this poem, I think. Uh, we find both, and that's incarnated in the, uh, in the terrible, terrible beauty. But there is also a sense of awe and recognition and humility that he has in the face of what's happened, and a recognition of moment in this, uh, in this um, uh, 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 rising. And he moves, and this is the um, uh, uh, third stanza. Note well, uh, the third section. Note well, at the end of the, the uh, first two sections, a terrible beauty is born first, a terrible beauty is born second. Third section, which is one very much dwelling in the natural world of change, we don't get that refrain at the end. We don't get uh, 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 a terrible beauty is born at the end of this, partly because a terrible beauty is born in can, it indicates a sort of a mythic realm, whereas this is about the world of change. Um, and the world of change and movement and history, which he sees fanaticism or rebellion as blocking. Uh, but, it's, but it's ambivalent, I think. So we, th those lines I, I quoted often taken out to indict fanaticism. Um, the trouble is the living stream. So on the one hand, we can read that as a stone whose fixity, the fixity uh, 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 and, and this, if you like, the petrification in the sense of something which is, which is uh, frozen and unmovable, contrasts with plenitude, movement, dynamism, uh, fecundity, fertility, sexuality, as opposed to something fixed. And that's one way of reading it. And that's the way I think it often is re read when it's seen as simply an indictment of um, the, the, the rebels and political action. There's also a sense that troubling the living stream, that the stream without stones, the stream of history, is inactive, is, in, is unmovable. So there's a sense, I think, in which the ambivalence that we're talking about is incarnated in this, in this stanza. Pegasus, our winged horse in the last stanza, has become the horse, become an ordinary cart horse, the horse that comes from the road, um, the ride of the birds that range, cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change, and this again, the sense of momentum building up. A horse hoof slides in the brim, a horse plashes within it. Change, this is not, this is, this is very much about nature aligned with a changing, moving world. Um, there's sort of a sense of amnesia here, because everything's changing minute by minute, but it's change. Change as opposed to fixity of the most, uh, 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 um, and uh, the, the, the poem in some, in some ways in its meter and its rhythm is about change in terms of its build, everything's changing quickly and it's driving us forward in the way we read it. But it's also about permanence because it, it, it's aware of itself as a poem. And of course we get repetition in, in rhyme. We get repetition in the way it's rhymed. And then we move to the, um, the final section where Again, much quoted, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. And then we move to, I think, one of Yeats's most interesting poetic uh, uh, devices, which he uses a lot, which is questions. Yeats often uses questions in, in, in his poetry. Um, and the temptation of a reader is to answer them. But I think, I think that, the, uh, that, the, uh, that, that, that in, in this case, they're not really answered. Oh, when may it suffice, that is heaven's part, our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her charge. Pulling back, I mentioned the humility he felt. He doesn't want to name it. Uh, and he's tempted into poetic cliché. He's tempted into the cliché here of calling death sleep, which is a very, very venerable uh, 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 technique uh, from, 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 from the Renaissance. Oh, what is it but night fell? And he goes, no, no, he's not going to sweeten it. His, his duty here, which is, a very no, which is a very noble duty, is to bear witness, is to give recognition and elegy. And he says, no, no, what is not a night for? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith, a reference to the Home Rule Bill that's been passed, uh, that would come in after the First World War. For all that the son that the son has said, we know they're dreamed enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And then he moves in the final stanza, of excess of love. We're moving in this section between these intimate images, the mother love naming her child, excess of love, to public uh, commemoration. That's one wonderful thing about this poem is the way it combines these oppositions, fixity and movement, private and public, uh, 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 tragedy and comedy. Um, and we move forward in, in, into action, just naming, just paying recognition. 
uh, in this extraordinary ambivalent poem. I'm going to wrap it up there because I wanted to leave a few minutes for, for some questions. Um, so sorry, for, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for, um, Well, let's see whether there are any questions. At least one, please. When did Yates die? 39. 39? Yeah. So he lived until the, even the Second World War. Yes, he did live until the, 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 the Second World War, yeah. That's one, one follow up. Did he, have a, he had a bit of a feud with Ezra Pound, didn't he? I think most people had feuds with Ezra Pound. But he, <laughs> he, uh, he, 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 he did. I mean, Ezra Pound wrote a, uh, like, uh, a, sard a sardonic tribute yeah. priest under Bear Van Bowman's buttocks. <laughs> Loy is a poet twice the size has it, uh, of William Shakespeare. Really? Uh, so they, so this is what he writes. Ezra Pound writes, under Bear Van Bowman, Bowman's buttocks, Loy's L-O-I-S, a poet twice the size, O-I-C, <laughs> of William Shakespeare, or so they say, down, ba down Bally Killy shocking way. So he's kind of writing a sardonic tribute to him. But yes, but he worked very closely with Pound. Pound is at the centre of European writing, mm. uh, enables everybody, enables the publication of Joyce, working with Eliot, writes, effectively writes the wasteland, and collaborates with, with, with Yeats over many years. They go to Stone Cottage. I just said just one word in defence of Yeats, because I've said a, lot of, a few things criticising him, of his politics. There is nothing in Yeats which is anti-Semitic. Unlike, yeah, no. There is a trace of anti-Semitic. Unlike Pound, who was an, an anti-Semitic, unlike Eliot, and unlike, I have to say, Maud Gaughan, there is no anti-Semitism in Yeats for whatever noxious aspects of his politics there exist, particularly in the 30s, because Yeats does get some quite shocking political views in the 30s. So he was just kidding around when he wrote the wrote poem about the tobacco shop. Which poem do you think? Is that God of Venus and Mercury, Petra of Thieves? Um, well, who are we talking about? Yeats? No, Ezra Pound yeah. wrote it. It's oh, a yeah. response to the like of oh, Ms. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Pound is, is mocking and playing and... and, yeah. and um, uh, yeah, I mean, they had a long relationship with including some former Right. They can talk quite a lot about their vigilance very persuasively. I'm just thinking, sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, the rebels of 1916 almost seem to embody one side of Yates' ambivalence, you know, the romantic and the anti scientific, and it was astonishing how anti scientific or non scientific those rebels were yes. in their preparations and their sort of strategic stupidity, it would seem. Mm. And so it's no wonder that he was ambivalent about them and their, the results that they brought or failed to bring and so on. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in terms of, in terms of uh, 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 I think he was very struck. And other elegies he's written, like 16 Dead Men, he talks about blood, uh, as, you know, making the tree grow. And the, he, 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 I mean, 1916 was all, almost instantly left history and entered myth because it became about sacrifice and became about uh, the uh, uh, failure in order to create other, other, other greatness. So kind of, and that was all tied in with Pierce's uh, 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 Christian imagery and the idea of Christ and the fact that it happened at Easter and all these things. So, so Yeats is, um, it, it cleaves to it because, uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about scientific, but we could maybe use a different word, pragmatic, that is sort of a different sort of pragmatism. Michael Collins scorned it. He said, oh, it had an air of a Greek tragedy. And he meant that as, as, as an insult. But there's a certain sense in which, yes, that kind of, I mean, it's a very troubling thing, I think, but a kind of ethic or myth of failure is something that, uh, which failure becomes success, is something that he's drawn to, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm reminded of the Gallipoli in that context where failure becomes success. However, I wanted to ask you a question. It interested me when looking in, into Yates' life in this exhibition and hearing you talk, how did this man who was anti-materialist and middle class mercantilist mm. values, how did he support himself as a poet all that time and bring up a wife, bring up children? Oh, well, I, I mean, it's a very good question and I think a fair one. And I think we, well, the one thing we don't look for in the age is consistency. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, you know, and he, 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 I don't think he'd even claim it. He, he, uh, Fam I mean, look, look, famously Yeats, when, when news came round, there was a delegation went round to his house in 23, when he'd won the Nobel Prize. Someone from the mayor's office, I think, came round, so there were press around. And he opened the door to the house when he was told. And his first question was, when he got the news, how much? Right? <laughs> 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 how much is he going to get? So, I mean, um, uh, Yeats was certainly, and even you can see in the letters, letters back, when he marries, uh, when he marries, um, uh, 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 um, uh, Georgie, yeah, George Hylees, 
uh, Georgie Hardlees, he kind of, everyone's writing back, you know, she's rich, of course. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not trying to make him into some sort of a rapacious gold digger. I'm just saying that he was certainly, I mean, his, he, he, there was a lot of indigence when he was growing up. It must have been hard. I mean, I mentioned his father earlier. His father uh, um, gave up a promising law career to become an artist and moved the family to London. So he would have had poverty when he was, you know, not poverty, but certainly insecurity around that, around that front. But he had a lot of benefactors. I mean, certainly, as, as he, by the time he won the Nobel Prize, he was fated and a very successful poet. He, he, I mean, Lady Gregory uh, uh, gave him a lot of support. He went there and lived there. So for, for every summer, she took care of him and made him hot water bottles and hot milk. And, 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 um, and, and you know, uh, uh, but he, he, and how did he, I mean, he was able, by the time, remember, he got married late. So when you ask how, how he afforded the family, he got married in his, in his 50s uh, and was a hugely inter famous international poet, a lecturer, senator, uh, and he was able to afford a tower, Tour Balili in, in, in Galway, um, which was also became um, a symbol of his poems, or a symbol in his poems, should I say. Any further questions? Uh, yeah. uh, presumably he was alienated from the Irish language. Was that a problem for him? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it wasn't a problem for him. I, alienated, he didn't learn Irish. Um, he was very interested. I mean, this is, I think, uh, unlike Singh, Singh learned Irish and, was, and, 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 and spoke it very well and went to Aaron and conversed at Yeats's advice, or so Yeats would have us believe, uh, went to Aaron uh, and conversed. Yeats didn't, and he kind of, but, but um, I, I, I mean, I, I think that his attitude to the Gaelic League would have been very complicated. Uh, uh, other people of his class and caste, uh, like Douglas Hyde, obviously a Protestant, leads the Gaelic League and would have been part of his, his, his background. Yeats didn't. Uh, I, I mean, Yeats had certain problems with language. I think he was, with language generally, not just the Irish language, but learning languages. And he was an extraordinary genius, a great poet, but was probably dyslexic, I think, now that we now realize, could never spell. You know, I mean, extraordinary. if you look at his letters, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, psychology with an S. The story goes that he, he, he applied, once applied at, 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 at um, at the behest of his friends, probably looking for security, for a chair in Trinity College, Dublin. Now, he never, we remember, he didn't really go to, he went to art college, he never had a third level education like many of the others did, like Joyce did, for instance, albeit in, a, in, the, in, 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 the, uh, in another university. But he, and he uh, didn't get the job as, uh, in this chair because he put two Fs in professor. <laughs> okay, so he, so he had, um, uh, uh, there is kind of um, loads of stories like that about, about his spelling. So I think that, I don't think he, was, he would have been a naturally gifted linguist. I don't think he was ill-disposed to the Irish language at all, but he certainly, he came in for a lot of criticism for a certain, from a certain sort of nationalist in the early years of the 20th century who would have been hostile to the Abbey and hostile to him and his enterprise because they would have seen it as ascendancy condescension and not authentic nationalism. So someone like Daniel Corkery uh, would have criticised Anglo-Ireland for that. D.P. Moran, Yeats's great nemesis, editor of The Leader, would have seen him as inauthentic. But I think uh, Yeats would have argued and did argue for the validity of an English language Irish literature. One more question. It's really a, a footnote to a question that's already been asked. Um, I had the rather grand title a decade ago of the National Wandering Historian for the Centenary of Federation. And uh, Richard helped, uh, Richard O'Brien helped get me to Ireland for a, a sort of lecture tour. And uh, I lectured at the Gregory Kiltartan, uh, Kiltartan Gregory Museum in Galway. Uh, the museum was clear and uh, seats were put in and it was filled with farmers. And I talked to the farmers about an Australian politician called Patrick McMahon Glynn, uh, who's a very interesting character for lots of reasons. But I asked the assembled company about uh, Lady Gregory's patronage of Yeats. And there was a high level of, of discontent with that question, yeah. that, that somehow the poet lived you know, by his poetry. And, and not by royal patronage or, or aristocratic patronage, as it were. Really? So uh, it, it was interesting to see at the local level uh, around Cool Park, and pretty close to Ballylee, uh, this level of hostility about Yeats's actual... Uh, sort of, they, thought, they thought it was sort of a parasite? No, 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 no. Oh. I think they thought that, uh, you know, that, that somehow poets lived by poetry. And they lived on poetry, and that was you know, wonderful. You know, cloud oh, of course, Yeats would, Yeats would have been very aware of two things: in the Irish tradition of the sea, 
being associated with chieftain yeah. and writing poems for the chieftain, and he would have been associated with that with those 18th century, uh, and, well, those ancient, like much older traditions of, of the fili, fili in, in, in the Irish tradition. He also would have been associated because he wrote about it in his poems when he's complaining about the attitudes of of of, of, of patrons of the arts, of the de Medici's and of the, of the Florentian sponsorship. So I mean, I don't think Gates would have had any problem with the idea uh, that that mere mere business people should 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 give their money to something as great as a great poet. Uh, nor did Joyce. <laughs> a lot of uh, generous women in his life. Right. I would like to call the proceedings to an end. Uh, Professor uh, McGonagall will be here to answer any further questions uh, in, in an informal setting, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you would like to do that. Um, I would like to thank the Embassy of Ireland again for uh, their uh, support for this, uh, this event. And uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, coming, of course. Uh, please, uh, if you haven't done so already, please sign this, the visitor's book, which is at the uh, entrance of the building. Uh, and you can leave your uh, business card, if you like, if you would like to be informed uh, uh, about future events here at the Centre for European Studies. Um, there are also flyers about upcoming events, including the event that I mentioned previously uh, next Tuesday. Let's uh, thank Professor McDonald again for his... Thank you.